All righty. I think that's um, plenty of time to wait. Um, so we'll get straight into it. Um, as I said, my name is Lara Simmons. Um, as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm calling in from New Zealand. Um, but thank you so much to everyone who's calling in, listening to this webinar today. Um, as you can see on the screen, we are talking about event marketing hacks. Um, and the reason for that, um, well, there's many reasons, I suppose. Um, but um, earlier in the year, we hosted, um, the Event Tech Tribe hosted Unite, which some of you on the call today may have attended um, or heard about. Um, but um, essentially, it was a, an event for event professionals to come together, support each other, talk about the industry, talk about the changes, um, and talk about the pain points and, and support each other. Um, and one of the biggest takeaways that um, Rami and myself and, and the, the entire tribe actually took away from it was that um, there's not enough support for event planners um, um, in terms of marketing your events. Um, it shouldn't be a headache, um, and, it, and it shouldn't be something that kind of keeps you up at night. So um, yeah, here we are now. Um, end of August talking about um, event marketing hacks um, and hopefully um, you guys will be able to come away with a, a few things um, that will, will help you in terms of promoting your next event um, and and a few less sleepless nights hopefully. Um, cool so I'll hand you over to Rami to introduce yourself and um, we'll get straight into it. Hey everybody I'm Rami Merriman and I'm the marketing director at Hub and I'm super excited to talk to you guys today uh, about event marketing best practices. As someone who's been in the marketing trenches for the last 15 years um, and has worked really closely with event managers and I've attended um, a ton of events myself I've learned a few tricks over the years and um, I'm super excited to share them with you and I hope you find them helpful. <laughs> awesome um, and as I I said, my name is Lara Simmons. Um, I'm calling from New Zealand, so it is super early on Friday morning. Um, hello from the future for those of you that are in America. Um, and, um, and yeah, I'm in marketing at the Event Tech Tribe. Um, I also own a small business marketing company. Um, so um, I work with yeah, small businesses based down here in New Zealand. And um, I think for, for me, um, being kind of, I suppose, on the other side of the world, um, sometimes in the middle of nowhere, it seems, um, uh, yeah, working our marketing efforts and, and, and kind of cutting through that that noise um, is something that, that kind of underpins a lot of the stuff we do down here um, and I do I do with, with businesses that I work with down here. So um, I think that's essentially um, where I'm going to be coming from with, with, with my tips and tricks and, and talking about cutting through the noise because it's a, it's a noisy world out there at the moment and, you know, there's a lot of competition as I'm sure you guys are aware. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll hand back over to Rami. Excellent. So before we get into the good meaty tips and tricks, um, just want to take a moment to acknowledge the folks who put on this fabulous, fabulous webinar series, which is the Event Tech Tribe. So the tribe is made up of a group of like minded technology companies, and we've all come together to provide a really awesome full stack sort of best in craft solution for meeting planners. Um, and so the individual folks within the tribe include Swugo, who provides a seamless mobile responsive registration and event website solution. Um, the badging and on-site heroes at TRC, if you have on-site needs, they truly are your best resource and not to mention some of the world's nicest guys. Um, yeah, second that, they're amazing. <laughs> <laughs> the incredibly cool and super easy to use audience engagement tool, Glisser, which lets you set up polls and gather feedback directly from your audience in real time. Um, if you've never checked out anything like it, I definitely recommend it. I think you'll really like that. Um, and then there's, of course, my company, Hub. Um, and we provide end-to-end -end content management for your event. So everything from call for presentations and abstract grading to speaker and session management, um, all of which can be updated and published across all of your marketing channels instantly. And then finally, we've got Inside XM, which is an all-new um, event analytics platform that will pull together all the data from all of the different tech, um, starting with all of the data from the tribe, um, and should really help you gather valuable and useful insights. So we're super excited to be partnering with them and, and see where they help take us in the future. Awesome. So before I jump into um, my kind of first section on email marketing, um, I did want to kind of um, take a quick poll and get a pulse of where you guys are at in terms of, um, you know, marketing experience. I realized that it's a very broad topic. Um, so we wanted to kind of get an idea of where you guys are at um, and, and, you know, um, make sure that we, we, we tailor our, um, our uh, yeah, our content to make sure that it's irrelevant, it's relevant to you guys. So I'm just going to launch a poll now. Oh, 
Awesome. I'll give it a few more seconds. Cool. All right. I'm going to close that up now. Awesome. So, um, yeah, really interesting. Um, there's a pretty broad range of you guys. Um, a few of you are, as you can see on the screen now, um, you are just dipping your toes in the water. Um, a large chunk of you are, are nice and in the middle, um, which is perfect for today. Um, and, and hello to you, 21% of you event marketing ninjas. Um, nice to have you on the call and hopefully we um, provide you with some stuff that um, you, you didn't know already. Um, so um, yeah, awesome. Thank you so much for participating in that. Um, cool. All right, we'll get straight back um, into the content. Um, so first section, I'm going to jump straight into it um, and talk about email marketing. Um, reason for that is it's probably something that you guys are all doing. Um, it's definitely something that you've probably all seen and experienced. Um, it's um, and, and if it's not something you're doing, um, it should be something you're doing. Um, in actual fact, um, I was reading a few stats this morning, um, over 86% of businesses in the B2B and B2C space are using email marketing technology. Um, and the industry itself is, is growing um, phenomenally, um, which obviously um, speaks to the fact that I suppose there is a, um, a, big, a big demand for it. Um, so that the industry is expected to grow by another 20% in the next few years. Um, and it's already a multi-billion dollar industry. So Email marketing, um, I suppose the takeaway from that is it's huge. Um, um, and, and the reason for its growing in, in popularity, there are a few schools of thought, um, but, but one, one quite popular one is, is in actual fact, the, the rise in social advertising. So things like Facebook ads, Instagram, Twitter, um, Snapchat, all of that kind of stuff, um, which we will dive into a little bit later on for those of you that want to talk about social. Um, the rise in that um, has, has been phenomenal. Um, over the last few years um, and, and because of that it took away and, and it was kind of a lot of people's primary uh, marketing kind of platform I suppose um, and as that became more popular people started to get more desensitized to the way in which um, they were receiving that kind of um, digital ads um, and, and similar to how you guys receive a letter in the mail now and it's kind of um, I suppose quite a, a delight or a surprise, um, email marketing started to kind of fall into that realm of things. So um, it's, it, it's, it's getting there and it's, it's, it's growing in huge amount of popularity. At the moment um, email marketing is thought to be the, the one platform um, of marketing um, delivery um, it has the largest return on investment. Um, there's there's a few different different stats out there, but one recent one that I've seen pop up a few times is for every dollar spent on email marketing, you can expect to receive about a forty dollar return. Um, obviously, that depends on your industry and stuff like that, but it's um, it has got a, a huge potential for return on investment. Um, Last point there is email, email platforms are becoming increasingly sophisticated. As more companies are adopting this technology as their kind of primary um, way for, um, for promoting their events or their, 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 you know, their, their products or whatever it is, um, there's more noise. Um, and because there's more noise, email platforms, Gmail being a, a classic example, are coming up with new ways um, and new technologies to ensure that they, they cut down that noise so that their um, their customers, i.e. the um, the end user, um, is is not getting kind of bombarded. So this next section is all about providing you guys with some hacks to make sure that you are getting your emails into inboxes. So without further ado, hack number one, um, personalize your content. Um, so, so this is a really interesting one. Um, as you can see from the picture there, it's a really simple example, but making use of personalization variables um, in your email marketing technology um, will allow you to to kind of bring a little bit of personality into your um, into your emails. Um, uh, as you can see here, we've got dear first name. Um, often people in, that, that don't use the variables will go for something like dear um, or, or hi there or something along those lines. Um, basically, essentially what this is doing is using these variables, it is making the email filters believe that your content is in fact intended for each and every recipient. Um, and that's kind of what all of these hacks, the general theme of them is, is make the email filters think that your emails are intended for everyone. Um, so you can take it a little bit further and be a bit more sophisticated the way you use these personalization variables, um, splicing them within the content, making it sound like a more personable um, email that you know someone has written and just sent to them. Um, and, and as you can see there on point number two, take it further and bring it into your subject lines um, where we're naturally inquisitive creatures. And so not only is that helpful in terms of the tech side of things and getting into the inbox, but you know it can help with your open rates and stuff as well. Um, it's engaging and it, it feels more personable. Mm. 
Yep, no, number two. So um, number two is A-B testing. Um, for those of you that don't know or you're just tipping your toes in the water, um, A-B testing is essentially um, splitting your database in half and then sending um, a slight variation of your content um, to each, each, each of the different um, tests. Um, pools um, and then measuring the results. Um, it's it's quite popular in email marketing, um, but you can you you may have heard it in a different context. Um, sometimes um, websites will will do it um, in in terms of um, letting people see slightly different variations of the homepage or something like that. That's a little bit more technical, um, but. I think, in my, my opinion, um, running an A-B test in email marketing is probably the easiest place to do it. Um, there's a few tips here um, when you're doing A-B testing and essentially what the, 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 the overall result that you want to want to achieve is, is the most um, the most bang for your buck, the, the most, um, yeah, the, the email that has the most um, highest engagement or, or, or creates the most um, desired reaction. Um, but my biggest tip here is is keep your variables to a minimum between your tests um, because you want to know exactly what is actually causing the changes. Um, you know, you could have a, an email that you send and, you know, you have a 30% higher engagement rate. Um, but if you've got 300 different um, variations within that email, um, you're not going to know what to change in your overall kind of strategy to make sure that you're keeping that engagement high. So keep it to a minimum. I go for two or three maximum um, in terms of maybe it's a, a slight button, uh, button, button color change, maybe it's a, a format change, something like that. Um, on that last point there, rich HTML versus plain text format. Um, so that's a really popular one. Um, I've personally done this test a few times. So that's sending half of your database, your emails in a rich HTML kind of templated format and the other half sending in a plain text so it looks like um, just a standard email. Um, there's a few different um, opinions on which one's better. Personally, um, in the times I've, I've AB tested this, um, I have had very different results each time. Um, and I think um, the kind of takeaway from that is, is that it really depends on your database. It really depends on, on who you're talking to. Everyone is going to react differently. So that's the beauty of A-B testing. Um, cool. Remy, next. Yeah. Well, I would just add to that before we move on that it's really also think about what you're trying to get across. So there may be some emails related to your event that are very visual. And so HTML is absolutely going to be a stronger bet. Some may simply be reminders about, you know, reservations or rooms might make more sense for that to be plain text. So kind of think about the the context that you're sending it in as well. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. There's no point doing a full plain text email if it's just like scroll, screes and screes of words. Um, yeah, um, think about the overall experience as well. It's definitely something you should always kind of bring it back to. Um, so hack number three. Um, so this one's quite a technical one. Um, use your event tech software. Um, and the reason for that is, is basically um, so email marketing technology or, you know, the platforms that, that you know, send your email marketing blasts, um, they, they basically put a digital stamp or a digital signature on all of the emails you've sent. Um, so a good example is something like MailChimp. Um, they will have a digital signature which says sent by a MailChimp. Um, and these larger email platforms, um, they, they do get known. You know, um, Gmail, for example, they, they know what to look for. They know what to see when they see these stamps. That's how they organize things into something like the promotions folder, which some of you probably have seen. Um, excuse me. Um, you've probably seen in your own inboxes, the promotions folder where all of your, your marketing emails go. Um, those sorts of um, sorts of stamps are good in terms of the user experience. But but what happens is, is obviously for you guys, you want to get the most cut through. You want to get your emails into the inbox. Um, using your event tech software um, is, is a really good way to do that because T t traditionally, they're not um, they're not as as widely used um, across across the industry um, as 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 email for email marketing, um, and and because of that, they have a little bit more cut through. Um, they're not you know um, blacklisted almost as as a, um, email marketing thing. Um, so potentially an opportunity to get to get in the inbox as well. Um, it's a little bit of a technical one, but um, but it can it can tend to work. Cool. Um, so less is more um, sometimes. <laughs> um, so this one is, is a pretty obvious one, um, but but I really recommend good comms planning. If you're going to do anything in terms of email marketing and, and changing things up, um, do some comms planning before your event, um, before you even kick it off. 
um, know what you want to say, know when you want to say it, um, to ensure that you're being proactive about the way you're communicating with your delegates uh, and you're not swamping them um, with irrelevant content when it kind of pops into your mind. Um, ensuring that you know you're you're more proactive and you're more on the ball um, means that you know you're not going to be swamping them and they're going to become desensitized to your important messages um, and obviously um, the result of that is 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 no one gets the the important stuff so um, so balance here is really really important um, in saying that obviously it is important to have a plan um, and and talk in a, in a semi regular fashion just to keep you your brand at top of mind. Um, and that last point there, send at the right time, um, send your information at the right time. Um, think about your audience, think about where they're based. Um, you know, don't don't go sending something in the middle of the middle of the night. To look, look at their time zone. Um, look at their you know their area if they got events coming up in their in their region where they're probably unlikely to be at work, therefore won't be checking their emails. Things like that um, are really important to kind of build into that timeline, just to make sure that you're you're giving your emails the best opportunity to get seen by the most eyes. I would also say um, definitely make sure that you're varying your message. So a consistent refrain of "Hey, the event's coming up." Hey, the event's coming up <laughs> over and over and over again. <laughs> definitely sort of wear down on folks. Whereas if when yeah. you have an exciting new speaker that you were able to announce or something new about the venue or maybe something about the party, um, you know, kind of mixing that up and varying those communications, I think, is a good way to maintain interest and engagement in what you're trying to say. Absolutely. And, you know, it's it's all essentially going to lead to the same thing. You know, you're saying, oh, we've got a new speaker you should come to our event. Um, but changing that message um, is sometimes all people need. Um, it just kind of freshens them up and go, oh, that's cool. Um, you never know what, what, what people are going to react to. So number five, um, change your center details. So personally for me, this is a biggie. Um, and I know a lot of companies do it, um, but but basically what it means, um, and you can see the picture is probably the best way to describe it, but, but commonly, um, our marketing emails, uh, the sender name, um, where you would expect to see, you know, if I'd sent you a personal email, it would come from Lara Simmons. Um, commonly in that sender column there um, on the left, it comes from the company name or the department name or possibly your event name. Um, and that's cool um, because that's, that is that is the reality. That actually is is what you're doing. Um, but what, what's happening here is, is, is that you're basically telling the, the email filter, this is a promotional email, chuck it in the promotions um, inbox, um, which is obviously not what we're talking about today. Um, so, so changing that, um, a slight tweak and, and, you know, changing that from rather than the business name to, you know, maybe it's your comms manager, maybe it's yourself, maybe it's, um, you know, someone in your marketing team, maybe it's your CEO, um, changing that sender details to an actual person. Um, it's going to, again, make your email filters believe that the content is in fact intended for the recipient um it, it'll hopefully bring it give it more chance of bringing it into that primary inbox but what it's also going to do is it's going to help your open rates as well um again as i as i touched on earlier you, you know the the more um the more it seems like it's for the person um the more you know they're, they're going to be likely to touch it um it's we're naturally inquisitive creatures um and and again it, it, it's more personalized um it's it feels like it's meant for the person, yeah. All right. Well, now that we've covered the nitty gritty of making the most of your marketing emails, um, what about connecting with people outside your existing contacts? This was definitely a big thing that came up at Ignite. Like asking how do you reach those elusive folks and how do you get them interested in your event? Um, and we're gonna be honest, getting attention can be tough. Um, but we think the next 15 hacks will really help you with attracting and converting them into registrants um, and hopefully possibly even delighting them so much that they become evangelists for your event. So next hack, PR. Why do we like this hack? <laughs> First of all, um, when it's a killer awareness booster, if it's done right, PR can be really the ultimate amplifier. Um, it can ensure that your message gets picked up and spread really far and wide directly to the people that you want to reach. Um, second, and I think a really important aspect of it is that it's going to increase consideration. Um, anytime you have media or a third party endorsement, it's going to carry a lot more weight and be seen as less biased than the same message coming directly from you. So as you're thinking about your strategy around here, a few things to keep in mind. 
Um, particularly when putting together a press release or a media pitch, you want to spend some extra time and ensure that your message is really super tight. Um, really focus and stick to the core story you want to tell and then back it up with just a few key message points. Um, I strongly suggest don't go into too much detail and don't overcomplicate things. Um, to also keep in mind that when someone else is telling your story, which is what will happen after the release goes out and gets picked up, um, is that anything that you provide is up for interpretation. So you really want to be as clear and as precise as possible to avoid any confusion. And a really important element of PR, of course, is the press release and a great press release like a great essay. It really just follows a basic formula. So you always want to open with the lead. Who are you talking about? Uh, what did you do? Is it uh, announcing your event? Is it a product release happening at an event? Um, and then why? Why should people care? And then you want to follow that with just one or two paragraphs that contain your key message. So, for example, if you're announcing a new product, mention the key value props, but don't do a deep dive into all the features. That's just going to be one of those things that confuses people. Um, they might get all wrapped around the axle about one particular bullet point when really you want them to focus on, um, you know, the core value props. And then always include one or two quotes, preferably an internal and an external, and then finish it out with an about paragraph. And make sure that you always include a media contact who can answer any follow-up questions. And make sure you get links back to your site. Um, there's really excellent SEO juju to be gotten from these releases, so you want to make the absolute most of it. And then if you want a few more tips on working with the media, there's actually a really great blog post that we put together um, which is linked to here in the slides, which we will be providing you afterwards. And, and just to add there as well, you know, I, the thing I love about PR is, is, is it's a, it's a cheaper alternative to, you know, if you don't have a huge budget, um, you know, I've worked with companies um, like this before, you know, their budget is, is pretty small and, and adopting a PR strategy, um, it can give you maximum um, kind of amplification for, for a smaller amount of money compared to something like a paid advertising campaign. So um, it's definitely worth considering, especially if you are, um, you know, keeping the, the, the purse strings tight. Absolutely. All right. Our next hack is social media. So you want to think about when you're creating your plan for promoting your event. Um, obviously, the first thing you think about is your audience and where they live. If your attendees are into... Um, say crafting or design or something like that, then you would want to maybe include Pinterest in the mix. And then if you're trying to reach IT decision makers or IT folks, um, a Google Plus or a Reddit might be good options to consider along with your traditional LinkedIn um, and Twitter. And I also encourage everyone to think beyond organic. Um, paid social can really be an excellent way to boost your message outside of your already established channels. And if you haven't spent time in it, the targeting that they offer can help you reach the exact right people that can do really excellent targeting. And if it makes sense, if it makes sense for your audience, Facebook advertising in particular, it's really inexpensive. So again, if it makes sense for you, I say definitely make use of it. And then another really key thing is to find your tribe. So um, your event audience is going to be passionate about something. So and they're most likely already got an online community that you can tap into. This could be a Facebook group. It could be a LinkedIn group. Um, could be some other kind of online communities where your audience hangs out. Um, and that's a really another excellent place to reach them and um, let them know about your event. I'm sure pro a lot of you are probably members of um, the variety of different LinkedIn and Facebook groups that exist for event planners. And if you're not, definitely, um, definitely check them out. And then don't be afraid to build your own community as well. So creating a Facebook page and a Twitter hashtag, keep it simple, and then just really own it. Um, and that gives the people who are passionate advocates about, you know, whatever your particular event happens to be about. And um, it gives them a place to meet and ask questions and share ideas. Awesome. And, and you know, um, building on that, um, so talking about paid media, um, you know, uh, Rami touched on paid advertising um, in, in terms of social, um, but I'm sure you've all heard about like um, something like AdWords, um, which is basically um, paying Google um, to, to rank your, your website in their, in their search engine higher. Um, and you would have seen those little green ad um, boxes for those of the, those, of those, um, those listings that have been um, targeted in that way. Um, 
if you if you're using this strategy, awesome. Um, uh, I can personally um, say that you know I know AdWords is 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 kind of a um, it can be a bit of a headache at times, right, Ramy? <laughs> yes, it can. It can, and it can seem yeah. very overwhelming uh, when you first start. It can. Yeah. Yeah. So, so my biggest tip, um, especially if you are just dipping your toes in the water, you don't have any AdWords experience, um, and we've got Bing there as well. Um, again, fish where the fish are. If your audience, you know, if you have some research to back up the fact that your audience are actually, um, you know, Bing is their go-to search engine. Um, you know, get clued up on using Bing, I suppose. Um, but but AdWords is the kind of status quo. Um, but if you are using it. Um, Start simple um, and, and don't kind of overwhelm yourself because it is going to be one of those things that you'll wake up in the light in a, in a cold sweat because you're just like, oh, God, this thing. Um, but you can get quite powerful with it. Um, and, and, and basically what it essentially does is it, is it drives more traffic to your website um, and, it, and it creates more buzz. Um, and it hopefully, if you're targeting correctly, will get the right people into your website and then obviously registering and getting, um, getting more people to your event. Um, so a few little um, things to recommend here. Um, so negative keywords. So so essentially negative keywords are um, are telling the Google search engine if someone search for this searches for this thing, don't show my ads. Um, so a really good example that actually Ramy and I talked about yesterday was um, let's say your um, your event is is called um, Odyssey. Um, you know. Um, Obviously, there's a car called the is it Honda Odyssey. Um, yes. You, you want to make sure that that is a negative. That's a negative. That's a negative keyword um, because um, someone searching for Honda Odyssey is absolutely not going to be interested in your event Odyssey, which um, is possibly about something completely different. <laughs> um, so, so you can imagine negative keywords working um, in very kind of um, linear fashion like that. Um, other things you can do with things like AdWords, you can target based on. Um, behaviors you can geo target so you can set a radius around just an area um, and just target people searching for your keywords in that region um, and retargeting so retargeting which you've probably all personally experienced um, is when ads follow you around <laughs> um, around online so if you hit a website um, and then you go and search you know you start browsing on online later on um, it's seeing ads pop up from that website that you've once hit um, really popular on Facebook as well. Um, you'll see going through your newsfeed, the sponsored posts are typically um, from websites that you've gone to before. Um, if you're doing retargeting, my biggest recommendation is to um, limit the amount of times your ads can view in a day. Um, that was one of the big big things that I learned when I first started learning about AdWords um, because we've all experienced it, right? You're like, you feel like you're getting stalked by an ad um, that you don't want to see. Um, so I always try and limit it to one or two times a day. Um, just to make sure that people aren't going to kind of start get frustrated with your brand um, because that can actually be detrimental. Um, and finally, um, Google Ad. If you are doing Google AdWords, um, don't don't be afraid to reach out for help. So um, Google do have consultants who provide a free service to people that are starting a campaign, um, and they and they help you get it all set up. Um, and and in my experience, um, they they can be helpful. Um, but the best recommendation I make is 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 actually come up with some questions before you go into it. Know what you want to ask them, and then they'll they'll answer your questions for you. Um, if you kind of go in empty-handed, um, things can kind of start. You can kind of leave feeling a bit more confused than you went into it. Um, but they do have they do have those services and those those resources. So make use of them. All right. Influencer relations. So I know what some of you guys are thinking, <laughs> but this is really is more than just um, Instagram celebrities hawking clothes and gear. It can make sense for you guys. So um, every industry and subject matter is you're going to have people that are the leading voices and the trusted advisors. So for your industry and target personas, ask yourself, do some research. Are there bloggers or celebrities or other folks in the media who have large audiences? And then go find them and then give them story ideas and content. They're just like the media going to be hungry for new and interesting things to write about. So definitely make sure whatever you send them is interesting and relevant to the types of things that you normally see them writing about. Um, or you can also offer them the opportunity to participate in your event. I think this is actually a really cool thing to do. And I've seen some interesting examples of it. So Ask yourself if there's a way that you can make them feel special. So it could be a behind the scenes tour or a thoughtful gift, 
So anything that you can do to help make it a really memorable experience that they'll want to write about will pay dividends over time. I can absolutely guarantee it. And then, you know, use their audience to amplify your message. All right, inbound. This is one of my favorite topics, event content. <laughs> 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 so when you sit down to map out your content, um, always remember the first rule of writing, write for your audience. So um, when you're thinking about an event or maybe you're an event website, you want to ensure that everything written about your event, this is everything from the about description to all of your session topics, not just the topics themselves, but how you write about them. These all need to address the specific needs and concerns of your audience. And then you want to get that information up onto your website as early as possible. So I say publish early and publish often. And if you wonder why, um, it's because content does a really good job of showing thought leadership. It's going to absolutely drive SEO, as we talked about earlier. Um, and it's going to bring new people into your sphere of influence. And so if you have been asking yourself, you know, what are other good ways to use content in the event space? Um, it's definitely not as widely adopted in, as in, say, the B2B SaaS space. Um, I say an event website can absolutely have a blog. Um, it's a great place to share ideas and new updates related to your event. It can be sort of a good hub for you. Um, and then I know that content can create, it can really take up a ton of time and a lot of energy, and it, it can feel really overwhelming. Um, so I say tap into your community. Don't try to do it all yourself. Um, definitely make use of this by, you can encourage your sponsors and your speakers, those two in particular, because they're heavily invested in your event already. Um, get them to publish a blog. Get them to post on social. Um, possibly even email their networks about their participation in your event. So definitely reach out and get some of those guys to do the heavy lifting for you. Also, make, make use of photos and videos. Even if they're just short little clips that you do on your phone, um, those can be great little teasers prior to the event, during the event, um, and can drive interest to particular sessions or topics or things that you want to drive interest to. Um, and then definitely continue the engagement after the event by making sure that the conference content is available after the show has ended. Um, this is definitely one for me that as an attendee, I'm always disappointed if it isn't offered. There's always, you know, two sessions that were happening at the same time and I wasn't able to make one. And then I would love to be able to go back and, and watch that one later. Um, and then one final but pretty critical element if you want to dive into content marketing is, you know, everyone says that content is king, um, but honestly, it's really, it's not, going to be work for you if it's not useful, if it doesn't add value, um, and really if it's not authentic. So this goes back to bullet number one, which was write what people care about and be really genuine about it. So people can tell, um, they can tell if you're just throwing fluff on a page and it will definitely turn them off. So hopefully you're sharing a particular passion about your event and what the audience cares about and, and that can come through in the in things that you write. Totally. And just to touch on that as well, you know, I think I think there are so many missed opportunities, um, especially, you know, um, Rami and I were talking about this yesterday as well, down here in New Zealand and Australia, I think, um, particularly, people aren't using this. And, and again, it's such a popular um, strategy in, in all other aspects of, of, of marketing. Um, but but content marketing um, in events, there's, you guys are a content machine. Um, You've got so much uh, resource and, and you can tap into that, um, you know, like, like Rami said from your speakers, you know, what's to stop you from doing a, a webinar with, um, you know, a couple of your speakers, maybe doing a panel, get people excited about your content that you're going to have at your event. Um, it's, it's, um, oh, it's just, there's so many, there's so much potential. Um, so I'm really looking forward to seeing people start to pick this stuff up over the next, over the next few years. Yeah, and it'll be really interesting to see. I want to see the creative ideas that come out, I think, particularly of the event space. Totally. Absolutely. So this next one is SEO, and um, you've probably heard Rami talk about this um, a few times, but basically uh, SEO, or um, search engine optimization, is basically increasing your organic ranking of your website um, in, some, in, a, in a Google search engine or, or thing, um, if you're using that. Um, but for, for simplicity's sake, we'll stick with Google for now. Um, but um, so search engine optimization um, is, is basically 
getting to know the the Google algorithm um, to increase your website um, and 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 get more um, more people clicking on it. Um, easier said than done. Uh, that's probably my number one kind of thing to, to give you here. Um, but um, again, as Rami said, inbound was her favorite. I would say SEO is probably my favorite to talk about. Um, so so um, there's kind of um, a few a few kind of layers to this. Um, but my first kind of tip for you for you all is if you're not familiar with SEO, don't overwhelm yourself. Again, similar to AdWords, it's it's something that um, you can kind of um, you can enter a rabbit hole very quickly. Um, a quick research online, and you'll learn about different topics. Um, and before you know it, um, you're kind of right in there, and it's just too much. Um, but um, here's my here's my basic overview. Um, First of all, Google, they update their algorithm. Um, they've come out and said they update their algorithm um, almost every day, um, but they do definitely update it, um, uh, do a big update a couple of times a year. Um, so nobody definitively knows exactly what what um, affects your, your search engine ranking, um, but there are a few pretty good ideas um, in terms of what, um, what are popular. Um, and I'm gonna go to my paper just to make sure I'm giving you guys the right information. But the first one is, is your on-site optimization. So, so keywords on your website. So Ramey was talking about um, all the words um, writing on your website, um, making sure it's, it's engaging. Um, if you can write it and splice in some keywords, so let's say you're, you're doing a, um, I don't know, a florist event, um, you know, making sure you're using keywords like florist and flowers and um, event and conference and all of these kind of things, keywords that people are likely gonna be searching for, the more that they're in the copy of your website, um, the more Google is going to find that and say, oh, cool, this website is uh, is appropriate um, for for this person to see. I should probably rank it higher so that they can see it. That's probably what they're looking for. Um, the next thing is backlinks. Um, so you can see on the second point there, build links within your site. So backlinks are um, within your site and also external to your site. Um, are basically, uh, a backlink is um, any website um, that's not your own um, that is linking into your website. So um, a good example of, of, of one way people do this is PR, um, which Rami talked about earlier. Um, sending, out your, um, sending out your media release and making sure that you've got some links to your website embedded in, that wor in those words. The minute that someone copies and pastes that and posts that on their own blog or their own, um, their own news agency, um, you're increasing the, the awareness of your website. Um, and Google has, has technology which will, which will scan those websites and, and see those links and go, oh, cool people are talking about this website, it's obviously something that should be ranked up higher. Um, obviously, it, Google's brain doesn't think like that. Um, <laughs> it's technology, but that's kind of essentially what it means. Um, and the third and kind of final big one is is, is create content and send it out regularly. Um, so having a content stream constantly, as Rainy just talked about before, um, is not only good for your audience, it's also good for, for your SEO. Um, sending out blogs, um, is obviously a great way to be able to continually incorporate your, your keywords um, for that first point that I talked about, keywords on your website. Um, but it's also um, keeping your website fresh, always adding pages. Um, is basically telling Google, this website is active, it's, it's up to date. Let's keep checking it. Let's make sure that we're, we're, we're showing it as much as possible. Um, and my final kind of side point, which is, is quite a new one, um, it's kind of only just come into, into play, I would say, um, maybe in the last 18 months, is, is make sure your website is optimized um, for mobile. Um, if you can do that, um, Google is adding that into their, they, they have added that to their search algorithm. So a mobile app optimized website um, is, 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 a, is a biggie um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of making sure that you can um, get your website up higher. Um, so yeah, those are kind of the, the basic things, um, but just, just think about awareness. Every time you're posting content, think about how will I get the most eyes on this and stuff like, you know, when you're posting a blog, making sure everything's tagged, um, all of that kind of stuff, making sure you're, you're, you're making it as explanatory as possible. Um, because um, again, um, it's, it's, the, it's, gonna, it's gonna make sure that more eyes get onto your website. And I would add similar to content. This is a definitely a, a start early and work on it often, even if you can only do little bits yeah. at a time, because this isn't definitely not a flip the switch. It's going to, but everything that you do will eventually pay oh, dividends, yeah. but it doesn't turn around immediately. So it may take time for um, you to see improvements in ranking based on the things that you do, but definitely keep at it. Totally. Yeah, yeah absolutely. 
And, um, you know, actually one recommendation I'd make is, um, you know, there's some really good tools out there as well if you do want to really look at your organic ranking. Um, uh, one I use actually is, is called Moz. Um, and, and that's really good for, for not only looking at your own website, but looking at your competitors. Who is searching, who is kind of ranking ahead of you um, and looking at them and, and, seeing, and seeing why they're ranking ahead of you. Um, what keywords they're ranking better on, and then and then you can kind of create a bit of a proactive strategy around getting higher. But yeah, it is it is a long it's the long game. This one is the long game. If you've got a, a reoccurring annual event, um, this is this is the one for you to kind of have a look into. But um, but yeah, don't don't lose sleep over it because honestly, it's um it's not worth it. It's it's so it, it's it's a it's a big one. <laughs> it takes it takes time. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, so we talked a bunch about all these digital channels, and digital is awesome because we can measure it to death, which we all love to do. <laughs> but there's really nothing like print to send that like tactile, visceral message to someone. So especially if you have a smaller event or VIP meetings within your event, you know, sending out a box with some pre-show swag, um, maybe a key card that gains them entry into a private event. That is the kind of stuff that will have impact that's just not possible via email. And it really allows you to, as a bit funners, have fun um, and really show your creativity. And then industry orgs, these are your friend. Um, basically any topic or anything that you can think of has an association or society associated to it, <laughs> which I have discovered. Um, so go out and find the ones that make the most sense for you and the most sense for your audience and your event. And then look and see, oftentimes I have a calendar um, and you can post your event onto their calendar, um, reach out and ask, it never hurts to ask. So will they let you contribute a blog post? Um, you could even, you know, make it as simple and as plug and play for them as possible. So give them a pre-written email and social copy and see if they'll promote that to your, their members. Um, you know, some have paid programs to do that, but others are oftentimes willing to work with you, especially if it's just social social promotion. Um, and they'll work with you and, and help you get that stuff out there. So they are excellent resources and definitely make sure that you're taking advantage of that. So the next one is use your website. Um, so this is particularly um, relevant for those of you on the call today that are part of a corporate or, an, um, or a business that plans a reoccurring annual event. Um, you've probably um, got a website for your event, but you've possibly also got a, a business website. Um, and and it's, it's, it's basically, it's real estate sitting there waiting for you to use it. Um, if you have that platform available, you know, add call to actions, add buttons that are linking people to their website. Um, especially, you know, um, you know, it's if people are hitting that website and they're part of the audience that you want at your event, um, it's a no-brainer. Make sure that you're pushing people right through to the website. Um, and again, it's mutually beneficial. So not only is it good for generating traffic to your event and your event website, um, it's also it's also good for SEO and 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 um, you know, cross-linking the two websites. Um, it's not going to make it's not going to do any harm in terms of your organic ranking. Um, and hopefully, it will um, it will do do good. Um, if you don't have a corporate website, um, there are other options as well, as Rami touched on, industry organizations, utilizing them, um, getting, your, getting your event um, you know, logged into their calendar, um, but also reach out to stakeholders, sponsors, people that are speaking. They all have events, um, they, sorry, they all have websites. Um, and, and if you can get your, get your event promoted on the website, um, then again, you're, you're opening up your kind of, um, your web of, of, of um, awareness, I suppose, as well, um, and again, mutually beneficial. Um, and if that's if that's the the line that you need to use to to convince them, um, then absolutely. Um, if they if they know about SEO, um, being able to cross link between sites is is not a bad thing, um, and it won't hurt their website. All right, let's talk about loyalty. So I would say that everyone we included likes to feel like you're part of something. So if you have delegates that are loyal to you and come to your event year after year, absolutely show them loyalty in return. If people are loyal to you, be loyal to them back. I cannot stress that enough. Um, give news and information to them first. Uh, give them a chance to sign up before anyone else. Think concert pre-sales. Um, offer them special discounts and invite them to exclusive events. This will 
garner you further loyalty. If people find out that there's opportunities for people who are loyal, um, it encourages them to want to come back as well. So this is really just a win-win for everybody involved. Cool. And um, my last one in this section here is, is run a contest. Um, so this one's pretty straightforward. You've probably seen it before. You've possibly also done it. But um, if you're not, um, it's a nice, easy way to to kind of generate traffic, um, but also facilitate engagement. Um, and, and, you know, um, that's what we all want, right? Um, the beauty of running a contest as well is, is, is it also does allow you, especially if you are, if you are using social media in your contest, um, it will allow you to identify who your advocates are, who are the people that are really in, in, engaged with your brand. Um, and, and, you know, I like to call them um, sneezers. <laughs> um, which actually, I was talking about this with someone the other day. Um, the reason we call them that is, is because, you know, it's one person, but um, like a sneeze, they kind of, um, <laughs> it's kind of a bit, a bit gory, but they have a, 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 a wide kind of range. They, they can reach many people. Um, um, so, yeah identify those people that, um, that Rami was talking about earlier as well, you know, the, the sneezers, the advocates, um, the, the people that have the, the clout um, and, the, and the backing behind them. Um, and then, you know, follow up with some, with some strategies to make sure that you're making use of that, um, of that audience that they have. Um, so again, there's a few examples on the page there, give a prize to the person who tweeted the most, um, give away registrations or, did, or just kind of tickets to people that refer people. Um, it's all about increasing engagement um, and also kind of building that positive word of mouth as well. You know, the minute someone wins something, people want to talk about it because it feels good. Um, I'm sure you've all done it before as well, you know. Um, and and if, you're, if you're sending out positive word of mouth, um, there's no harm in that at all. Yeah, absolutely. I did something very similar, I believe it was last year for Collision, if I got X number of additional people referred and signed up, then I got a free ticket. So those things, they absolutely work. Yeah, cool. So um, our last kind of section, and we are conscious of the fact that it's um, it's coming up to an hour now. But um, but marketing one hundred and one. So if you don't take if you take any way anything away from 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 this um, this webinar today is is you know it's the it's the basics. Go back to your bread and butter, and um, and and you know you'll be fine. <laughs> um, so here's a few, you know, we've got a few tips here um, reminding you of some of the simplicities of marketing um, and, and, you know, if you can bring that into your strategy early on, um, the fundamentals, um, I think, I think you'll be fine in terms of getting set and, and going forward. All right. Fundamental 101, know who you're targeting. So we talked a lot about audience throughout all these different slides and as we walk through all the different event marketing hacks. Um, but before you start trying any of the hacks out, you really want to make sure you spend the time to really understand who that audience is. You know, sit back and ask yourself, who goes to your events? And then flesh out really detailed personas, include demographics and psychographics if those are relevant. Um, and then, but one piece of advice about this on the persona thing that I've noticed that some people do is um, don't try to subdivide folks too much. It's likely that there's really only a few key personas that everyone falls into. Um, sometimes people try to really subdivide them, but uh, ask yourself how many different types of custom experiences can you create for them? Um, if it's not a channel or something then that you can do and create a customized experience at your event, then um, see if it can wrap into sort of a larger persona. And then one of the best things that you can do when you're identifying your core audience is to go and look at all that data from your previous year's events. Um, so did you ask questions during registration that allow you to build a really comprehensive demographic profile? Um, and then if not, what questions can you ask this year that can help you fill in any gaps and in information that you want to know? And then take a look at all the other data. Like what did people do? What sessions did they attend? What sessions did they not attend that you thought that they would? So all of this will help give you like a really sort of holistic 360 degree view into your audience and what they're interested in. And this is going to inform everything that you do. So once you have a sense of who this audience is, then you can really start building on all of the other pieces. But this is this is a really core bedrock piece that it's absolutely worth spending the time um, to nail down before you do anything else. And just to add there as well, you know, it feels good. It feels good when you know who you're targeting. Um, because there's nothing worse than, you know, feeling like your whole marketing kind of strategy is, is built around like questions and like, oh, will this work? 
work? Will this work? Will this not? When you know who you're targeting, then you've got a persona for them. You can kind of apply a, you know, um, give them a name. If you want to give your persona a name and, and you know, think of it an actual, think of it as an actual person. Um, it, it's kind of liberating. So um, if the, for those of you that have never done this activity before, I, I totally urge you to because um, you'll thank yourself for it. Trust me. Um, so my next point here is keep your brand consistent across all of your platforms. Um, again, marketing 101. Um, but but uh, my first kind of point here to make is, is brand. Um, we don't need to think about it just as aesthetics. Um, your brand absolutely is your logo, your font, your colors. Um, you know, the image that you portray, but but it's also so much more. Um, it's your message, it's your tone of voice, it's it's what you stand for, it's, you know, uh, you know, are you a quirky kind of, do you have a, a kind of quirky way of talking? Are you more formal? Um, all of that comes into your brand and, you know, some really good ways to kind of uh, wrap your head around this kind of stuff is to think about some of those really popular brands. Um, you know, think about Nike or, or Adidas, and, um, and go look at their websites and read through their content because you'll see that they do have a consistent voice. Um, and, and, and that voice goes consistently across all of their platforms. So what they're saying on their website, they will also be saying on their Facebook page or their Twitter or their LinkedIn. Um, ensuring that there's consistency, um, it, it means that you know, you're creating a more, a more solid backing for, for your audience to kind of actually build a bit of loyalty in terms of, of knowing your brand and feeling like they can relate to it. Um, the minute you start getting wishy-washy, um, that's when people start to lose focus on what you're, what you're doing. Um, again, hashtags is a really good one for events as well. If you've got a hashtag, stick to it. Make sure you use the same one on Facebook, on LinkedIn, on, on Twitter. Um, nothing worse than, than kind of, I, I've been at events myself and being like, what's the hashtag? Um, and then they've got like three on the screen or something. It's confusing. Stick with one, make it consistent. Um, it's nice and simple and it makes things easy. Trust me. <laughs> also make it original. There's nothing worse than having a hashtag yeah. and having it also be a hashtag of something completely unrelated that you don't want your event to be associated with at all. <laughs> So do a little research. Absolutely, on that. absolutely. Yep. <laughs> All right. Last but um, almost almost last, not least. Let's talk about goals. So much like the other two pillars here, before you do anything else, you really want to stop and think about what it is that you want to achieve. So is it to drive as many registrations as possible? Is it to ensure that your event is profitable? Is it to increase customer loyalty? Each of these things are going to drive you to do and engage in different types of marketing activities. Um, and then take the time to make them smart. You know, I think most people are familiar with that, but this is a refresher, specific, measurable, actionable, realistic, and time bound. If you take the time to make your goals very specific and smart, um, that'll really push you into the right direction. And I know we're coming up on the very end here. So super quick last, and this one is definitely not least, please take care of yourself. Burnout is a real thing in this industry. Um, and it's, you're so busy taking care of other things and taking care of the events that you often will forget to stop and take care of yourself. Planning an event is a marathon. It's not a sprint. Um, so just make sure that you are doing what you need to do to take care of yourself. And there's a little link here to this guide to work-life balance that we've created that has a list of tons of different ways that you can, you know, take care of yourself in lots of little ways. So check it out. Um, and thank you all so much for taking the time. I know we, we went long a little bit, um, <laughs> but hopefully you guys got so much value content, out of this. <laughs> yeah. um, and we really want you to go forth and market your event with Wild Abandon. Um, we do not have time for q and I, I apologize, but if you have questions, our contact information is listed right here, um, email and on Twitter, um, as well as our web addresses. Feel free to shoot us a note and we're happy to answer any additional questions you have. Absolutely. Thank you so much, guys. And, and we will be sending the recording around. Um, I've also got plans to put this into a weblog, blog, um, making use of my own tips. So, um, <laughs> um, so you know, if you do want to share it with your colleagues or friends or other people in the industry, um, we want you to, to be able to feel like you can market with confidence because um, it shouldn't be something that keeps you up at night. Absolutely. <laughs> excellent. Well, thank you again. And I hope everyone has an excellent rest of their day.